guys will echo the same thing that I'm going to say. That you, it's a treat for uh, you to get a chance to listen to uh, what I consider uh, to be the uh, number one basketball coach in the country. And again, I've been around 25 years and I've been with some good coaches, but uh, this guy knows basketball. And uh, uh, for him to take the time out of his, his busy schedule to, uh, to come and speak to you, it is a very definite treat. Because he just, first of all, uh, has been doing it so long and has done it for such a long time that he he, he just doesn't have a lot of time to do it. And uh, for, for him to come and do it, believe me, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for you guys. But he also, it's I think, the uh, uh, respect that he has for, for his assistant coaches. And that, that's what makes him so good, is that he treats his assistant coaches uh, like their head coaches. And that's why they get to be head coaches like myself. You guys have anything to add? I would like to say this. And I don't even know whether Coach Sutton knows this or not, but I've known him a long time professionally. I've played against his teams. He's played against mine. We've talked basketball. I've worked his camps. He's been in my home. I've been in his. He talked about 1978, 1979, those great teams with the triplets and getting ready to play the Notre Dames and the Indiana States and the NCAA tournament, things like that. What I remember most about Coach Sutton is how he cares about people. I had a seven or eight year old son in 1978-1979 that was born with a birth defect. Coach Sutton found out about this. He sent him all kinds of razorback paraphernalia, hog hats, autographed programs from the NCAA tournament, anything that he could. I, he, he cared. He found out. Today, my son loves the Arkansas Razorbacks. Matter of fact, when I took a North Texas team to play Arkansas, at Arkansas they got a guy that runs around with a hog flag, especially when they get a run going, they run and dunk on you. Well, my son was following that guy, pulling for the Razorbacks when he was playing the Eagles. <laughs> but he believes uh, in what he says, and he believes in coaching. Every one of you are in coaching for the same reason he's in coaching, and that's because we care about kids. We want deal with uh, the problems that we've got today. One thing I would tell all you young coaches, uh, as you develop uh, your, and mature and go up the ladder as far as where you are, if you have the opportunity to have any voice in hiring people, the one thing that is most important, and it certainly has allowed me to be successful, and that is surround yourself with good folks. Uh, hire good people, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go along. And the one thing that I thought I would do this afternoon, because the, uh, the other guys, I think, are going to talk mostly about X's and O's, I'm going to talk about what I think you have to do in order to be successful. You know, there aren't very many major college coaches that have come up the ladder uh, like I did. I, I doubt if there's over 10 or 12 coaches that really have been successful that coached high school basketball. And I coached high school ball for seven years. And uh, from there I went to a junior college for three years. Then I was at Creighton for five years, University of Arkansas for 11 years, uh, Kentucky for four years, now I'm back home at Oklahoma State. And uh, all the way along I had good people that really did a lot in allowing us to be successful. But I want to talk about the things that uh, have been good for me. And uh, a lot of the things that I may talk about uh, you don't agree with. Some of you will say, yes, that's what I do, and that's a reinforcement of what I'm teaching. So this afternoon, I'm going to visit with you and tell you what has allowed me to be successful as a coach. Uh, how many high school coaches do we have in here? I'm just curious to see what kind of a cross-section. How many junior high coaches? Uh, does that cover everyone, or is there another group in here? How many first-year coaches? Raise your hands up. Don't be embarrassed. Second-year coaches. OK. Uh, a lot of the things I, I, I say today, I think that you ought to write them down because uh, they're pretty good, and they have allowed me to be successful. And what we did at Tulsa Central in 1959, I would say 80% of the things that we do today at Oklahoma State 
we did in 1959 when I started co high, coaching uh, high school basketball. You know, one of the things that uh, I like to do is to talk to coaches because basketball has given me the opportunity to travel every continent. I've been all over the world. And the thing that, uh, that would never have happened if it hadn't been for basketball. I grew up in western Kansas, out near Dodge City. And I grew up on a farm. My parents didn't even have a car. And we didn't have indoor plumbing. And we didn't have uh, indoor electricity. But they taught me a, a great set of values uh, that allowed me to work hard and go to college on a scholarship. And so basketball has allowed me to, to do a lot of good things. As I've traveled over the world, the thing that you may not realize that basketball is now the most popular sport in the world. The game of basketball was started 100 years ago in 1891 in Springfield, Mass. It's one of the only, only American sports, I guess, that had its beginning here. I was in China 10 years ago. And we were in Beijing, and then we were in Shanghai, and I spoke at clinics there. And you often think that basketball, you know, maybe it's popular in America and some countries in Europe and maybe in South America. It's the number one sport in China. And if you could go into Shanghai or Beijing, you'll see those young men and young women dribbling that basketball down the streets just like they do in our country. And uh, they love the game over there. And surprisingly, there's some big... Chinese. Uh, we were fortunate working with the uh, junior team of, of China, and most of the players, the men players, were all about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and very, very talented. Several of them would have been very good as far as being able to play here. I'm going to give you a little bit of my philosophy on basketball. One, be organized. Make darn sure you're organized in everything you do. Make sure before you go out on that practice court that you got a practice schedule. Now, it doesn't mean you always have to follow it, but at least you got a game plan. You can make adjustments as you go along. Second thing I writ written down here, if you were to come to our practice, we, <clears throat> we have what is called the three Ds of basketball. And our uniforms, on the front of our practice uniforms, it says dedication. On the back, it says discipline. And on the seat of the britches, it says defense. And if I were to sum up what has allowed us to be successful, the three Ds probably are the thing that has made that happen. The first D is dedication. And when I talk to you, I'm talking to you just like I talk to my players. Because I think there's... Uh, it's about the same whether you're going to be successful as a player or as a coach. I think every coach that I know of, if I were to ask all these young coaches, you have the desire that, yes, I'd like to be the best that I can be. I'd like to be able to coach at the level you coach at one day. And what I find in so many people and in so many players, not coaches, only coaches, but players, that they don't have the follow through. They have the desire, but they don't have the dedication to say, hey, I want to be the best. Uh, there are no shortcuts to being successful. The only place I know where success comes before works in the dictionary, and I believe that. If you want to be a good coach, then you're going to have to spend a lot of hours, and you're going to have to be a student of the game. Disciplined, on our, discipline is how do you manage your time? That's a good example. I'm always talking to our players about there's enough time for social activities. There's enough time to go to class. There's enough time to study, to play basketball, to go to church, everything. But do you manage your time properly? And what we find so often, players end up spending too much socializing. They don't understand that, hey, if you want to be a great basketball player, get out here on the floor. Just like I, I told some of our players yesterday, they were coming back in. We're having summer school starting tomorrow. I said, I will make sure you work hard when we start practice next November. But what you do all summer long will determine how much you improve. And I'm trying to show them, hey, manage your time this summer. All of them are going to summer school, or not all our players, but the guys are going to summer school. Got, they got jobs, but they got enough time to play basketball and get better. Coaches, same way. 
What do you do in the summertime? Do you review films? Do you have films, videotapes? Do you go back and say, hey, why did we win? Why did we lose? Did you evaluate you, yourself? These are things that I think you need to do. Two things, if I don't tell you anything else, you young coaches, Dave, one, you have an awesome responsibility as a coach. I enjoyed the seven years I coached high school basketball. If, if I had my way today, I'd love to go back and coach high school basketball, but basketball has given me maybe a way of life that they don't pay enough to high school coaches I couldn't afford to go back. When I first started coaching, my first coaching job, I got $4,200. I taught five U.S. history classes. I coached basketball, assistant football, and coached the golf team. Now, uh, they didn't pay very well then, and they don't pay much better today. But the one thing I would tell you that I've, all along the way, and this is important, treat your players like they were your own children. Treat them like they were your very own. And this is what I tell Russ Pennell, I tell Bill Self, I tell Rob Evans, and every other assistant coach I've ever had, hey, treat these guys like they belong to you. If you do that, those young men or those young women will go out there and they will give completely of themselves. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't get on our guys because we do. We're very demanding. And if they don't do what they're supposed to, they get punished, just like I punished my three sons. Uh, but they know that we, we, we lay down the boundaries, we lay down the rules and regulations, and we say, hey, we're going to treat you like we were your, your parents. You, we are your parents when you're here on our campus. We're, we're coaching you. And if they know that you love and care for them far beyond the basketball court, hey, they're going to go out there and play hard for you. And that's the other thing that I would tell you. A big key in winning is motivating your athletes to be the best that they can be. This year, our basketball team, you know, we got beat by Michigan in the, in the Sweet 16. We went all the way. We were one of the last 16 teams left. When you get to that point, everybody's good. You need a friendly call from the official or a lucky bounce or something good has to happen because everyone's got a good basketball team. When we got beat by Michigan by two points, and we walked out of Rupp Arena in Kentucky, you know, I was disappointed, but I was very proud of this year's basketball team because I felt like they maximized their ability about as well as any team I've ever coached. And that's what you want your team to be able to do, maximize what they have to give. There have been seasons when I felt like that our team didn't maximize what God-given talent we, they had been given. As a high school or junior high coach, and this is one thing that I always enjoyed so much, and I know that I had a, a very positive influence on all those young people that I coached because they still come back and call me and I communicate with them frequently, those players that I had during that seven years at Central High School and all the players that I've had since, you're in a position where you can be a great role model. And you can help youngsters when they're in junior high and high school. We try to do that at the college level, but it's a little more difficult because they're a little more set in their ways. But I think that uh, today it's tougher to be a coach. Uh, it's not as easy as it once was. It's more difficult than it was when I started. But it's also more difficult for a youngster to grow up in our country today than it used to be. And you're in a position where you can have a, a lot of influence on what they become. Shot selection is a good example of discipline. We have been, I guess, in the last 10, 15 years, if you look at Division I schools, we have had one of the highest field goal percentages for a team. We've averaged probably around 51, 52 percent during that period of time. And that doesn't mean I've always had the best shooters, because I haven't. I've had some brick throwers like you have. But now this is where discipline comes in. You know, you hear the term, he's a role player. Everybody's a role player. It's up to you as a coach to define the role that you want each one of your players to carry out. 
Shot selection, if you got a guy that's a good shooter, give him freedom. If you got a brick thrower, limit the shots that you want him to take. Say, hey, you don't get to shoot the balls, you get to the paint, or whatever it is. But we have a basic rule. You can't shoot the ball on our basketball team unless you can hit it 50% of the time. And we do this through shooting drills. We have managers that go out and chart shooting. We go out, when we start practice and we're in a scrimmage situation, we chart. Sometimes when we're going out and we're teaching offense, I'll, I'll, I'll say, hey, we're not going to shoot it unless we handle the ball 12 times. Or pick out a number, 14 times, 15 times. Now, when we start, I'll have a manager start counting passes. And he'll say, one, two, three. And if that's a good shot, in my opinion, I'll say, good shot, John. Four, five, six. That's the shot we're looking for, Jimmy. And we keep going up. And this is a way you educate your team to the type of shot you want them to take. It doesn't take very many bad shots for your percentage to go from 51 to 46. And at our level, if you don't shoot close to 50%, then you're asking for problems. So discipline, shot selection is a good example. I had a young man one time when I was at Central High School. I got him, and it was his last year. He was a senior when I went there in 59. Good player. Had been given the green light to shoot at any time. He's one of those youngsters that any time he crossed midcourt, he thought it was a good shot. Uh, that's the way he felt. And we're out there in practice one day there in, in November, and, and I'm trying to teach him what's a good shot for him, and he takes a bad shot. And I said, hey, Mike, we can't win if you take that shot. And this goes on for two or three days. Finally, there's a knock on my door. I had to hustle down from, from upstairs where I taught history classes, down to the dressing room, no planning period, put my practice togs on, and there's a knock on the door. And it's Mike, and Mike says, Coach, can, can I talk to you? And I said, yes, you can, Mike, come on in. He said, You've got me confused. I, I don't know what's a good shot and what's a bad shot. Well, I'm here to tell you today, you better make darn sure each and one of your players understands the shots that you want them to take. What's a good shot? What's a bad shot? What's a, a marginal shot? This is part of discipline. Uh, today, if a player came in and, and, and asked you, they would probably use the terminology, hey, coach, you're messing with my game. Well, you better mess with the game because you're going to get your fannies beat if you take too many bad shots. So that's a good example of discipline and shot selection. Defense. That's what we have on the Seaver Bridges. I was taught a long time ago because I played football, and when I got into high school, there were some outstanding high school football coaches, and I like football. I don't like it as much as they like it in Texas, but I think it's a good sport. There's a place for basketball and football. Football, basketball, soccer, baseball, hockey, any team sport where you are successful over a period of time, believe me, they play the D. And Bear Bryant was from Arkansas, and I got to know him. And when I went to Arkansas, Frank Boyles was the coach, and then Lou Holtz was there seven years while I was at Arkansas. And I used to pick these guys' brains. And if you talk to a football coach that's really good and they have a great record, he'll tell you that defense is the backbone of their program. And it should be in basketball as well. If you talk to Dean, you talk to Bobby, you talk to any of those guys, and they're going to tell you basically what I, I'm telling you here. The defense is the stabilizer. It is the thing that is more consistent in your program than anything else. When you're shooting a basketball, that's an art. There are nights that you go out and the ball doesn't go down. If you don't have defense to fall back on, then you may get embarrassed. But our defense is one, and they'll, they've talked about it. We play man-to-man -man about 95% of the time. There's nothing wrong with playing zone. And I don't care whether you play 94-foot defense, you play half-court defense, you play man, you play zone. But you better put some emphasis on, your de on defense because that is going to be the thing that carries you a lot of times when your offense goes stagnant. It's important that you sell your players on the importance of defense. Any player that has a little bit of athletic talent and you teach him the basic fundamentals of how to play defense can become a pretty good player. I had a player that first year at Tulsa Central. He'd, he'd only played basketball at the YMCA. I was coaching football, and I saw him 
play, and he was one of the most fierce competitors that I've ever seen. He's a football coach at a college up in Oklahoma now. Went on to the University of Arkansas and was a football player there. But I asked him, I said, Gary, would you come out for basketball? And this is my first year. I'm only 23 years old. We're in a high school that has 3,300 students. I ended up having 350 people come out for the basketball team. So I had some athletes. But I'm out there coaching football, and I saw Gary Howard. Boy, I love the way he played. He had knocked your jock off. And I, and I knew he'd played basketball at the YMCA. And I said, Gary, would you come out for basketball? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, I have never played. And we're playing in the highest division in, in Oklahoma in high school. Uh, and he said, I don't like to make the team. I said, you come out for 10 days and give me everything you can give, and I'll tell you where you can play or not. If you can't, then you can go on and, and, and go into a weight program in the wintertime. But if you can help us, and I think you can, if you show me that, show that same kind of attitude you have on the football field, well, he comes out and he plays. He couldn't shoot the ball a lick. I remember we'd get in a five game, like Bill's talking about. We ran a five game in 1959. We would hide him. That ball hit his hands. He'd have three guys running after him, trying to foul him. So we just hide him when we'd get to that point. Didn't want him to touch the ball because he wasn't a good shooter. But I tell you what he could do. I could go out before the game, and, and this is a term I use. Every team that I've ever had, we have what is called a stopper. This year and last year is Corey Williams. Corey Williams is a stopper. Well, Gary Howard was too, and I'd go out and I'd say, Gary, that guy's averaging 15 points, and we've got to hold him below double figures in order to have a chance to win. Give him to me, coach, give him to me. And that's the attitude he had. And he'd go out there, and the game would start, and he would jump on that guy and smother him. And he was a good rebounder, and as a result, he averaged about three points a game. But he helped us to win, and he understood how important defense is. And when I talk on television, I talk on radio, you know, fans take care of the scores. The thing that I always emphasize when I have an opportunity how important defense is, how important it is for those guys to get rebounds, how important it is for that guy that dishes off the assists. Those are the people that help you win, and they don't ever get enough credit. Once you teach your players how important defense is, and you've got to believe that, and then if they'll go out and work hard, you can become a pretty good defensive basketball team. I think Russ showed you what it, I think is my favorite drill, the Mr. Iba drill. I think it's a wonderful drill. And that's something else you want to take home with you. And uh, I don't know whether they talked about managers or not. Managers are so important. I mean, I'm sure they told you about the blocking dummies, the managers. We always let them in the Mr. Ivadrill beat on the guys, don't hit them in the head, but the shoulders and the belly and the back and everything else. Managers are important. I have five managers at Oklahoma State, and they are just as important. They are part of our family. They're part of our team. When we go to the NCAA tournament, I take them off because they work their fannies off. Managers are important because they're out there every day before practice. We chart every shot. They chart the shots. They're out there. There's so many ways that you can use those managers. And like I tell other people, when you run out of things, do let them go wash your car. But have a lot of managers because they're invaluable. They'll help you in so many different ways. Okay. Another thing for you young coaches, don't be embarrassed to borrow something from someone else. These older coaches who have been successful pick their brains. Study, why do they win? What are they doing that's right? Uh, that's part of being a student of the game. And there's certainly nothing wrong with borrowing something from some other coach. Part of our philosophy is being sound rebounding. Part of defense is rebounding. We have a rule. Every time you cross the midcourt line, we want to limit you to one shot or less. If we do that, we're going to beat you nine out of ten times. One shot or less. Our basic defense is put pressure on the point, overplay one pass away, keep the ball out of the pivot area, two passes away, slough to the middle and help. That's basically what we're trying to do. Shot goes up, we have individual responsibility, individual block out. Your man goes to the glass, you got to keep him off. If your man stays out for defensive balance, you fall to 15 feet, play the long rebound. If you see someone uncovered, 
underneath you go in and block him off. How do you block off? I don't know whether they got into this or not. Only two ways. You either drop step, get him on your back, butt down, move your feet up here. Don't be reaching down. Or crossover. In other words, there's the basket. Man starts down here. Here's a drop step. Here's a crossover. Early in the season, we will teach them both ways. We'll teach our players both ways. Then all I say is this. Keep your man off the glass. I don't care whether you use a drop step. I don't care whether you, you use reverse pivot or crossover. I don't care what you do. Your responsibility is to keep him off the glass. Mr. Iba, a man I played for, won three Olympic championships for our country, won two national titles. In my opinion, the greatest coach to ever coached the game of basketball. He had about five drills. I have too many drills, and I think that's another thing you have to do. You have to evaluate what you do. All of us <coughs> coach the game differently. That's what makes basketball such a marvelous game. But you have to every once in a while evaluate, what am I doing? And I know one thing I do, I try to do too much. I try to give too many drills. I try to do too many things, and sometimes I think that hurts us. And I always have to be on guard that we don't do too much. Mr. Iva had five drills. He would teach us a basic fundamental like I explained there on, on block out, and then he would say, hey, keep your man off the glass. You must be demanding. You can't have any slippage like that. And I'll tell you something else for you young coaches. The bench is a great motivator. The bench is a great motivator. If they don't do what you're, they're supposed to do, hey, sit them over there next to you. Put somebody else in. Pretty soon they get, they understand. So rebounding is important. Here's what we do when we, <clears throat> we shoot a basketball, depending on who we're playing. We follow with three, three and a half, or four people on the offensive boards. Here again is where discipline comes in. Everybody must understand what their teammate can do right and what weaknesses he has. They must understand what is his role. We're out here, we're handling the basketball, like I said earlier, we're counting passes. All of a sudden, we shoot the basketball. Now, when the shot is taken, here's what we're thinking. The shooter is saying, this is my shot, this is my shot, I'm going to hit it, I'm going to hit it, I'm going to hit it. The other four guys are saying, oh, no, he missed again. You must assume every shot that is taken is going to be a miss. If I'm an offensive rebounder, go to the glass early. Don't go late. Condition yourself as that ball is shot. If you're an offensive rebounder, get in there and root for a position. Don't stand there and then all of a sudden say, hey, I got to go rebound. It's too late. If you start to go and the guy doesn't shoot it, then you can always come back out. Now, the shooter, what does he think? I can hit it, I can hit it, I can hit it, it's released. Now I too must think that I missed the shot. I've got one of two things I can do. Follow the shot or get back. Don't stand and admire your shot. That's the only thing you can do wrong. You show me a basketball team when a shot is taken offensively and all five people are in motion, I'm going to show you a hell of a basketball team. When your team shoots the ball and you got three or four guys going to the offensive board and you got one or two coming out, and everybody's in motion while that ball is going through the air, you got a good basketball team. Offensively, we start when practice begins just like you coaches in junior high. You would think you were in a junior high practice session on November 1 when we start practice this year at Oklahoma State University because everything is fundamental. We're out there working on footwork. We're out there working on the rebounding like I talked about. Offensively, we're out there passing the ball, going and setting a screen on the ball, passing the ball, making a basket cut, passing the ball, screening away. Don't ever, I don't care what level you coach, don't ever get to a point where you assume your players know what they're doing. Don't get beat on mental mistakes. Make sure they are your sound fundamentally, make sure they understand, and if you do the things fundamentally in a good fashion, then you can run any offense you want to run. If you're fundamentally sound, you can do anything you want to do. 
But when we come out there, the first part of the first part of the season, we got dribbling drills like you do in junior high, footwork, screening. A lot. Of, I, I guarantee you, when you go back and start practice this year, you give your players a test and say, ask them about proper screening angle. I guarantee they won't know what you're talking about. You'll say, hey, pass the ball and go screen that man over there. I guarantee they, uh, half of them won't understand proper screening angle because my players don't. What is a screen? It's a block. It's a barrier. You put yourself in a position where your teammate, all you want to get is a half a step where you can get open. You watched the game last night. Hey, there's some pretty good screens being set. Great athlete. Pretty good screen. Both those teams are really well coached. The thing that is difficult today when I get a player, three things keeps them from playing quite often as a freshman. One, they can't play without the basketball. You put the leather in the hand, now they're pretty good. But they don't understand how to keep their man occupied, how to play without the basketball. That's a big adjustment they have to make. The second one is defense. So oftentimes they haven't been made to play defense and I, I can't ever fault high school coaches because if you got a guy that's really good you got to keep him in the game for 32 minutes so you can't be out there uh, with where he gets in foul trouble so you got to let him play a little softer maybe than what we want him to do and the third thing that I think is not as good today as it once was passing our society is careless our players are careless it's a carryover from just a way of life. If you go back and look at players when I played back in the 50s and the 60s, they were much sounder when it came to passing the basketball. Now, we didn't have any Magic Johnsons or Isaiah Thomases or Larry Birds, players like that. They could really pass the ball. Uh, Maravich was the one that started all that. But if you took a whole squad of players today and a whole squad 10, 15, 20 years ago, they don't pass the ball as well. Why? They're careless. You ask a player, what's a good pass? A good pass is any time my teammate can catch it. That's not the way it works. I pass a ball here. I go set a screen away, and a man comes off the screen. I have set a good screen. He set his man up. He breaks off the screen. He comes to the free throw line. If he gets a good pass, he's going to get a good shot. But instead, the pass is here. The pass is here passes here by the time he catches the ball recovers and faces up the defender has adjusted and now we have no shot so we are constantly and this is part of fundamentals constantly telling our players hey when you make a pass pass it away from the defensive man but pass the ball to your teammate where when he catches it if he's in a shooting position he can go up with the shot okay Offensively, I think the coaches talked about what we do as far as our running game. We want a fast break whenever the opportunity's there. Uh, team concept. I think you probably can gather by now that we are a family, we are a team. Some of you, and Tommy Newman was very, is very familiar with the group of players that I had in 1978 at Arkansas. Uh, we had a group, three guys that were called the triplets. Al McGuire called them the triplets. And by the way, Al McGuire, when I was at Creighton, we beat Marquette when he was coaching. They had a 110-game winning streak at home. We beat him. We beat him with a five game. So Al was very good. When he would borrow something, he would give that school credit. So he st you started using it. And when he won the national title the next year, I think they won it in 79, whenever they won it, he ran and he called it Creighton. So the five game's pretty good, and there's a lot of other people that, uh, that have used it. Uh, I lost my train of thought now. Huh? Triplets, triplets, my favorites. Sidney Moncrief, Marvin Dell, Ron Brewer. Great players, all 6'3", marvelous athletes, wonderful young people. Any one of them could have led the NCAA in scoring if I had driven them the green light. They could have all, any one of them could have averaged 30, 35 points. But this is where the team concept comes in. The bottom line is the team wins with honor, with dignity, with class, 
and individuals have to make personal sacrifices in order for that to happen. This is part of their role. I talked to Sidney, I talked to Ron, I talked to Marvin. I said, hey, guys, you're gonna, we're going to have to do our part, but nobody's going to get the green light just to score all the time. They all understood that. They averaged between, I think, 16 and 18 points. And we won 32 games, went to the Final Four, had a chance to win the national championship. They understood the team concept. I use the term, everybody's got to get both feet in the circle. We're in this thing together. And this is part of coaching that you convince every one of the people on your squad that it is a team game. They each have a role to carry out. And if everyone does the best they can do, then if we get beat, we can walk out of the gymnasium with our head held high. The next year in 1979, I've never been as proud of a basketball team as I was that afternoon. We got beat, but it was one of the classic games, and they still talk about it when they talk about NCAA games. We weren't as good as we were in 78. Brewer, Delph were gone, but we still had Sydney. We went to Cincinnati, and we played a school by the name of Indiana State, and they too had a great player by the name of Larry Bird. It was a fantastic game. Both teams shot near 60% from the field. Both teams shot 80% from the line. Both teams played, played with great intensity, defense. It was hard to get shots. They had four turnovers. We had five. And it came down. We held the ball for one shot. And U.S. Reed gets tripped. And it's a no call. He picks himself up and they call walking, which was the proper call if they weren't going to call a foul. They take the ball with 30 seconds to go, and they come down, and you know what's going to happen. They're going to go to Larry. Our defense stymies Larry. He gets no shot. Sidney cuts him off on a baseline drive. We give help. He kicks the ball out. Looks like they're not even going to get a shot. The ball comes over to one of their players right there, and Scott Hastings goes up to challenge the shot. The guy goes up in the air like this. And in midair, he knows he's going to eat basketball. He takes it to his left hand and just throws it. And the ball goes up and banks in. And we get beat. And we would have gone to the Final Four in Salt Lake City. And instead, they got to go. And Magic Johnson and Michigan State won the national championship. But that team gave everything they possibly could give that afternoon. Our coaching staff gave everything they could give that afternoon. In 78, I had Gene Cady and Pat Foster, two of my assistants, pretty good coaches. Gene had departed to go to Western Kentucky, but I still had Pat. But I, our staff prepared that ball club as well as they could be prepared, and we didn't win. And that's going to happen to you sometimes. But that's when you can walk out and say, hey, we did our best. That old sick feeling when you haven't prepared and you haven't done as good a job with your players and you get beat and you say, oh, why didn't I do this if I'd only done that? And that's happened to me before, too. Conditioning is part of our philosophy. If you don't get your team in shape, you ought to get beat. That is one thing that is very coachable. If they're not in condition, then you ought to get beat. Now, you're going to hear some of your players are out there running wind sprints or whatever you're doing. They're moaning and groaning and saying, oh, you're killing me. I have never known a basketball player to die on the floor for running him too much. I don't know of any. I don't know of any program. Maybe it's happened. Off-season conditioning is important. Make sure that you have someone that understands strength training. If they left it to me, I wouldn't be a very good strength coach, but I got the best one in the country. I brought him with me from Kentucky. And we know that our team has won because of what he does in the off season with those guys. During basketball season, we still lift three days a week to maintain our strength level. If you don't have a good strength program, then somebody that does is getting ahead of you. But once the season begins, I know that you are in a position where you can control conditioning. Enthusiasm. We call it catching the big E. You, you catch the big E, you don't teach it, you show it by example. Basketball was meant to be played with enthusiasm. It's the way it's supposed to be played. 
If you watch our team play, the one thing where it's very evident that we believe in this is when one of our players come out of the game, everybody on our sideline will stand up and clap for him. Again, this is part of making him understand. If he's turned the ball over twice or missed a free throw or something, we want him to know he's part of us. Hey, we knew you were doing your best, and when you come out, we're going to applaud for you. Enthusiasm is important. It's important that in practice that you are the first one on the practice court. When those players come out, you're showing them, hey, this is really important. Practice is really important. And when they come out on the floor, be enthusiastic. Let them know that, hey, this is the most important part of the day as far as I'm concerned. I talked a little bit about playing hard, playing at a high level of intensity. I think this is one of the big keys in determining how successful you will be. I think if you're sound offensively and defensively, you've taught the basic fundamentals, and then if you can motivate your players to play hard, you've got a great chance to win. And I know this, if your team plays hard, and nobody can ever criticize the teams that I've coached for not playing hard, because if they don't play hard, they're going to have a great seat over there next to me. And this is something you do sometimes in your individual talks with them or you do uh, when you talk to your squad. And this is one thing I do every day. I talk to the squad anywhere from two to ten minutes every day before we ever start practice. I'll gather them around and I'll, I'll talk to them sometimes about this, sometimes about something else. But I want to get their minds right before we start practice. I want to make sure all of us are tuned in to what we're going to do the next two hours on that practice court. What can I do as a young coach that will allow me to be where Eddie Sutton is when he's 56 years old, or when you're 56 years old? Okay, these are things that I've talked about. I think these are important. And all the things that I do today, I said 80% of the things I did in 1959 as a high school coach. You must develop a, a sound basketball philosophy. And as I said before, so many different ways to win basketball games. So many different ways. Two, attend clinics like you're doing right here. You've got to be a student of the game. Read books. Watch. See, today it's easier to be a, a good basketball coach than it once was. When I started high school coaching, we didn't even have films. And we didn't have films. Not until the early 60s did we ever start where I could film a game and look at our players and, and then, you know, show them their mistakes. So you have that opportunity to do that. But attend clinics, pick people's brains, listen to coaches that are successful. You may not completely agree, but maybe you can adopt uh, or adapt something that they're telling you to the, your program. Maybe it's a good drill. But don't ever get to a point where you're complacent. I know a few coaches my age that all of a sudden they get back in a rocking chair and, and they're they cease to be a student of the game, and I, I, I don't think that can ever be. Set goals for yourself. This is important as a young coach. Set goals for you individually and for your team. This is one thing I do with my ball club. I bring all the seniors in in the fall, and we will sit down and we'll say, hey, what are realistic goals? What, what can we accomplish this next year? And I'll sit down with them. I think we can be a contender for the Big 8 championship. Kansas is going to be one of the five best teams in the country, and they'll be the, the favorite. That doesn't mean we can't win. Another goal will be uh, win the uh, postseason Big 8 tournament. That's the only legitimate way you can go to the, the NCAA tournament. Third thing, go to the NCAA tournament. Last year they had six teams from our league go to the NCAA tournament. So if you're pretty good, you're going to be there. And if you're not pretty good, and if you're pretty good in the Big 8, you can play with anybody. So. We set goals, but we allow our seniors, and, and I talk to my seniors about training rules. I say, what, what, what can you guys live with? Now, once we establish these rules, now, if, if somebody breaks them, I will punish them. I have what is called a five and five club, a marvelous motivator. I started a five and five club at Arkansas. I had another chapter at Kentucky, and now we have a third chapter at Oklahoma State University. If a young man doesn't go to class, uh, if he doesn't do what he's supposed to, and we set the rules down, then he joins the 5 and 5 club. The 5 and 5 club is simple. We get you up at 5 o'clock in the morning, we take you five miles out in the country, and now you've got to run back to town. 
And when you get back to town, you go right to study hall. Then you eat breakfast, and then you go to class. Now, it doesn't take very many times for a guy to say, hey, it isn't worth it to miss a class. It isn't worth it to do something that coach and the coaching staff and my teammates don't want me to do. So the 5-5 five and five club is, is one way that uh, we get our young men going in the right direction. Now, those seniors agree to do these things, then they become my generals. They're my generals. My coaches are my generals, but they help enforce the rules. Job selection. Boy, I got to tell you this one. I have been very fortunate all the way along the line. I've never been an assistant coach. When I left Oklahoma State after my, I was a grad assistant, I was 23 years old, I became a head coach at the biggest high school in the state of Oklahoma. I was lucky, really lucky. And then I went to southern Idaho to Creighton. I went through all that. I had decided that I wanted to coach high school basketball, and I had opportunities during that seven-year period to be an assistant coach, to go to a junior college, and I never took them. And my wife taught home economics, and we were both happy there in Tulsa. And, and I just had no desire. I thought, boy, this is, this is what it's all about. I get to work with those 15, 16, 17-year-old kids, and I feel like I can do something that maybe will help them become successful when they leave Tulsa Central. One day I got a phone call. This guy changed my whole coaching career. His name was James Taylor, not the singer. And he said, I'm Dr. James Taylor. I'm the president of the College of Southern Idaho. I've got the finest school in the country. And I'm looking for a basketball coach, and they tell me you coach a fair game. That's the way he started. I can hear that just like it was yesterday. This was 1966. I said, well, Dr. Taylor, I'm flattered, but I'm not interested. He said, no, wait a minute. I'm not going to give up that easy. Greatest salesman I've ever known. I wish I could find a guy like that as an assistant coach. I'd get all the best players in the country. He said, I'm coming into Tulsa. I'm going to ORU to the Learning Resource Center there to look at that. And I want 20 minutes of your time turned into a four-hour conversation. The rascal convinced me that when school was out, I should drive all the way to Twin Falls, Idaho. Now, that's a long trip because you go all the way through the panhandle of Oklahoma, all the way up to Denver, up to Cheyenne, Wyoming, across Wyoming. You touch Utah. You touch a little of Montana. You go into Pocatello, which is in the southeastern part of the state, all the way up to Snake River, and you come halfway between Pocatello and Boise is Twin Falls, Idaho. He called it the garden spot of the world. Magic Valley is what they called it. On one side of the river, it's all irrigated. It is magic. On the other side, it's a desert. I pull into Twin Falls, go to a service station. I said, where's the College of Southern Idaho? And this attendant kind of looked at me strange, and he said, well, if you go one block straight ahead and one block to your right, that's the, the administration office. That's where the president office is. That's who I'm looking for. I pull up, and it's an office building, and there's an architect, a CPA, a lawyer, a dentist, a doctor, the College of Southern Idaho. And as I walked in the office, I thought, this is strange. I go in there, and Dr. Taylor, we visit, and finally I pop the question. I said, let's go look at the campus. And he said, you know what? I forgot to tell you, we haven't built it yet. And I said, you haven't built it yet? He said, no, but I got the greatest plans in the world. And he whips these blueprints out on me. He convinces me. He said, just think of this as an adventure. You can always go back to high school coaching. Come out here and join me, and we'll have lots of fun. Well, we did have lots of fun, and he taught me so much, and a lot of it has allowed me to grow and mature as a coach. Went there, 1966. Three years I was there, we won 83 and lost 14, the worst record of anybody's ever been at Southern Idaho. Boyd Grant followed me, Jerry Hale also coached at Division I, had great coaches. Fred Trinkle, who played on my first team, is now there. He's won 290 and lost 30 in the period of time he's been there. When I left to go to Creighton, they, they built that campus, and it opened, and it is truly one of the most beautiful community colleges you'll ever see. But that three-year period, I tell you what we did. We practiced, our students went to class when high school, it would be like having here at Trinity. High school's out at 
we come in at 4 o'clock. Our players would go to class from 4 to 10 at night. Then we'd practice from 10 to 1 o'clock in the morning. Then I'd get up because we had a dorm. I mean, a dorm was a house. Taylor and I went and bought this house, the university, or the college did, converted it into a, kind of a, a dormitory. And, and we had a cook, a house mother, but she can't drive. So I got to go over there every morning and get her and go to the grocery store and get groceries. We went down and we, we formed a booster club. I'll never forget knocking on every business. Would you join the Golden Eagle Booster Club? It only cost $25. And we got enough money there to, to uh, have our scholarship. Twin Falls is a town of 25,000 people. Had four black people living in the town at the time. We brought four players with us that were black, and we doubled the black population first year. What those black athletes did for that community, it, it was unbelievable. Wonderful young people, and there were people in Twin Falls who never seen a black person before. And actually touch them. They'd never seen a black person. Those four athletes were wonderful. And they did so much to help uh, that community, and since then they've had so many great athletes. But that three years I was there, they taught me a lot. And I took a chance. Sometimes job selection, you've got to take a risk. I went up there, and I never regretted it. But oftentimes I hear assistant coaches say, hey, I got, oh boy, I can't wait to get, be a head coach. That's sometimes I have to t tell my assistants. And, and again, I would never hire an assistant coach at the college level that I didn't think one day could run their own program. That's why I hired Rob Evans. I knew Rob Evans, the day would come that we would be able to help him and he would head his own program and he'll do great at Ole Miss. But I've ne I'd never hire anyone that uh, didn't have th that ability that I felt like would be a head coach. But sometimes I had to tell his assistants a job will come open. For instance, there's a job that was here in Texas that opened up, and there were several guys that I knew that wanted me to call on their behalf. None of my assistants wanted the job. But I had a couple of guys that wanted me to call, and I said, are you sure you want this job? Because, see, a job is no good unless you can win. Now, there are some jobs you could take Adolph Rupp, Henry Iba, Fog Allen, Dean Smith, Bobby Knight, and put them all there together, and they couldn't win. They're just places like that, and you better be selective. When it comes time and you have an opportunity to go, you better say, hey, this may not be the best job in the league, but do I have a chance to win? And this is one thing I'm always having to tell assistants. Hey, you don't want that job. It's not any good. And some of you young people here, the time will come when you're, you're going to have an opportunity and you've got to measure. Is that a job that I can win? And that's why I talk about job selection. I, I think that's very, very important. Approach every job as if it was your last. And this is one thing I've done, and I've left good friends and good feelings in, in all the places where I have been. Approach every job as if it's going to be your, your last. Now, you know that it isn't going to be your last in all likelihood, but they don't know that. And what I mean by that, I mean, hey, get in that community. I tell you, this is, this is something right down. Now, I don't know how it is in Fort Worth or, or Dallas, but in some of these other area, uh, towns out here, I know it's possible. Today, with as many things that we have going on, sometimes we don't have the community support when it comes to, to athletics. Well, you can help that, and this is one way. There are so many service clubs in every community, Lions, Kiwanis, Rotary. These clubs are dying for programs, I know. They call me all the time. They want programs. If they don't call you, you call them. Now, you may get turned down some, but you go out there and you explain, hey, this is what we're trying to do with our program. I've done that everywhere, and I guarantee I've made a lot of good friends, and a lot of those people have helped my program. At Tulsa Central they did, and certainly at Southern Idaho and other places. Oftentimes, we are arrogant, in my opinion, as coaches. Not all of us. But a lot of times we are, and, and because of that, some members of the faculty, we don't, they don't like us. And I think oftentimes we can help solve that problem by going into the faculty lounge and having coffee with them, having lunch with them. I think that's important. I think it's important to get to know your, your student leaders in your school. This is one thing I did when I was in high, school, in high school coaching. This is part of what I call the public relations part of becoming a good coach in, the, in your community. Hire good people. I've already said that. 
I've had great assistant coaches, and I've surrounded myself with good people, and they have done the job that has allowed us to win. Hey, you, you've seen these three guys in action. They're all good. They're all very, very good coaches, and they're all classy people. They're all wonderful people, and they represent our school in a very class way. I want people that are smarter than I am. I want people that understand the work ethic that I have. I want them to do that. I want them to be loyal. I think that's most important to me and to the school. I want them to be honest. I want them to be able to take direction. I certainly want them to be students of the game of basketball, and I want them to be people that represent us in a class manner. And that's what you want from your assistants, and that's what your superintendent wants from you, and your principal wants from you, and that's what you want your team to display. You want your team, when they go out in that community, to be people that you can be proud of. A lot of times we talk to our players, and uh, this is part of my responsibility as a coach in teaching young people to prepare them for life. And that's why I used to love co coaching high school basketball, because I'm telling you, you have an awesome responsibility. You can do that. And that's part of, hey, when it's all said and done, hey, those championships don't mean a darn thing. But I tell you what means something, all those young people whose lives you've had an opportunity to touch, and if you've touched them in a positive manner, I guarantee you, you're going to have some good feelings about yourself. That's the most important thing to me. I want those young men that leave me to look back and say, boy, Coach gave me something. He gave me something that has allowed me to be successful far beyond the basketball court. Write a book. You're a rookie coach, aren't you? One or two years? Okay. Funny things happen when you're coaching young people. Funny things. Write them down. Someday you may want to write a book. In one chapter, you want to write all the funny things that happened to me while I was coaching. I'm going to write a book when I quit coaching. I've already, but I've got notes and notes and notes. But one, I'll just give you an example of what I'm talking about. I have, a son, I have three sons. Stephen Edward, Sean Patrick, Scott Andrews. When I left Creighton to go to Arkansas, it was in the spring, and that's normal when jobs open at the college level. And it was around the 1st of April. Our oldest son was in elementary school. Sean and Scott were not. So Patsy said, I don't want to leave until school is out. I said, I understand. So I go to Arkansas. For two months, I'm down there. Call them every day. Only got back one time. You all have children, grandchildren. You understand when it lightnings and storms, they, they get apprehensive. When dad goes away for a week, they don't understand. Well, I was gone for a month, and Sean and Scott didn't understand where I was. And so during the month of May, every night they would get up and go and get in bed with their mother. So when I got back around the 1st of, uh, I should say during April they did this, the 1st of May, Patsy said, you need to talk to the boys. You need to talk to them because... They get up during the night, and, and sometimes I don't, I don't know they're there, and I wake up the next morning, and they're with me. And I said, I understand. So I sent them down, and I said, now, look, guys, if you have to go to the bathroom or you have to get a drink of water during the night, well, fine. But then you go back in and get in your own beds. You understand? We understand, Dad. I'll never forget standing there on the north side of Barnhill Arena there in Fayetteville, Arkansas, around the, about this time of the year, first week of June. We had our first basketball camp. Never forget, had 98 campers. That thing grew into 1,800 campers before I left Arkansas. Biggest camp, I guess, in this part of the country. But Patsy and the boys drove down that hill. Tommy's been there. Drove down that hill. I'm standing there talking to about 10 high school coaches that were going to help us with the camp. Sean jumps out of that car, runs over, throws his arms around me. He says, guess what, Dad? And I said, what is it, Sean? He said, nobody slept with Mom while you were gone. <laughs> That's a typical story of what I'm talking about. Another thing I would tell you young coaches, treat people like you want to be treated. Even if, you know, there are coaches at, your, at the other school that you want to be more than anyone else, treat people like you want to be treated. I think that's one thing that's probably allowed me to, to be fairly successful, and I think that's important. I've already talked about being a, being a shining example for your players, be a role model for them. Uh, strive to improve yourself any way you can. Take care of your bodies. You only got one of them. I tell my athletes all the time. You know, go get a car when it breaks down. You can't go get another body. So you better take care of your, the one you have. When you get my age, that really is important. That hits home. 
See, when you're young, like some of you, you think, oh, man, this body's going to be with me. I can do anything I want to do. I did some of those same things. But now that I'm 56 years old, well, it doesn't work that way. But these are things that I have done that I think have allowed me to be successful. Uh, some of them I think that you can relate to. Some of you young coaches need to write some of these things down. And if you do, uh, I don't have all the answers, but I do know some of these things work. There are no perfect jobs. Uh, I heard this cute story the other day. This coaching friend of mine over in Arkansas, he said, uh, and he's, he coached high school ball, I guess, at that one school for about 20 years. He said, uh, I think I found the perfect job. And I said, where are you going? And he said, uh, well, I'm going to the state penal institution, state penitentiary. I said, you think that's a perfect job? He said, yeah. I said, several reasons. He said, you know how important it is in basketball to play at home? And I said, yeah, I understand. That home court advantage is pretty important. He said, I got 27 games all at home this next year. He said, the second thing, he said, uh, you know, the game of basketball, and I believe this sincerely, has improved in so many ways. Athletes are better today. I think overall coaching is better. A lot of things. But one thing is not much better is officiating. It's about the same. Uh, and it's a frustrating game. It's a tough game to call. But anyway, officials are important. And you know, the old zebra can make a couple bad calls against you and change the whole complexion of the game. So he said, you know how important officials are? I know. And he said, I've got my three best brother-in-laws all calling all 27 games. And that's what you call a home court advantage. Third thing I think is important, he said, or it's important as far as being a perfect job, I coach athletes three years, you get them four, hey, I got 11-year letterman up there. The turnover isn't quite the same. And he said, you know, I've had problems through the years with parents. Johnny's not getting enough playing time. He said, I don't think any of my, the mother's ever going to be calling me about that. And he said, last, you certainly will relate to this. When you lose a basketball game, you know how it is on Sunday morning in every coffee shop in Oklahoma. They all replay that game, and, they, you know, that hindsight's something else, and sometimes we don't make good decisions as a coach. He said, I don't think any of my alumni will ever come back and heckle me like some of your alumni do. So maybe that is the perfect job. Miss, missing parents, this is important. You high school and junior high coaches, this is one, one thing I did at Tulsa Central, and this really worked well. I never had a, a parent call me and tell me that I wasn't playing their son enough. And i tell you what I did early in the year. Uh, about the uh, old middle of October, before we started practice, I invited all the parents, and, and we had cut the squad down. We had about 30 players on our A team and B team. And I invited all the parents. Not all of them would come, but a lot of them would. And I invited them in like in the evening at 6.30, 7 o'clock. And what I did there was this. I, I would talk to them just like I'm talking to you, and I'd say, hey, these are going to be the rules that we have. These are things that I think are important for your son and for us to have some success. And then I would tell them, if you don't think you can live with this rule, then let's talk about it. And... But if you agree that this is what we're going to do, if your son doesn't follow the rules and I am forced to punish him, then I want you to be backing me all the way. And so they agreed to that. And like I said, in seven years, I never had one parent call me and say, hey, I don't like what you're doing with my son. So I think that's something else for you young coaches you might consider. Basketball is a simple game and like I said earlier sometimes I have to really check myself because I I have a tendency to complicate the game I have a tendency to do too much and I think you have to check yourself every once in a while but it is a simple game don't complicate it be sound in your approach to basketball be fundamentally sound be sound offensively defensively work hard get out there there are no shortcuts to being successful then get your players to play hard. Everybody's got a way you can get that guy to give his best. Some players, you got to pat them on the back. Some players, you got to kick them in the face. But it's up to you, and that's coaching. It's up to you to get to know your personnel well enough that you know what the key is to make that player perform at the best of his ability. Now, when you do those things, 
you got a chance to win. Now, you got to understand this too. Coaching can take you only so far. You got to have you got to have players. They taught me that in Kentucky. They, there's never been any jackasses winning the Kentucky Derby. They're all thoroughbreds, and you got to have good players. But sometimes you may not have the best players, but if you're sound in everything you're doing, you got a chance to win anyway. You may be able to outcoach that particular team. Questions. We got a few minutes now here. I thought. Sometimes I talk to junior and high school coaches, they have questions that they'd like to ask. Bleachers, as long as you've been in here, it's time to go home. Yes? What is the most fundamental thing you want to teach you from a judge? Okay, shooting is one thing, in my opinion. Y'all want to stand up and stretch, go ahead. Uh, this is one area maybe 10 years ago I discovered that I wasn't doing enough, and that is having enough shooting practice within practice sessions. In other words, you know, I think all of us, when they first come out, they're all shooting the basketball. But within the practice, I think you have to have supervised shooting. I think. You have to put them under game conditions. Even when they come out before practice, and this is something else y'all need to do. This is where managers come in. When they come in, there can't be any grab fanny out there, you know, guys messing around, telling jokes, laughing. When we come on the floor, man, it's serious business. When they come out there and they got a basketball after they've warmed up, and they go out there, we're going to have managers charting their shots. And then we're going to post those so they understand that, hey, how many did you hit today? What's your shooting percentage? I think this is important. Peer pressure is great. But it's important during practice after you've really worked hard, then all of a sudden take a five-minute break, and some of you may do this in shooting free throws, but spot shoot. Spread out all of the different baskets, however you have, and have managers charting those shots. I think that's important. We do that a lot. I don't think you shoot enough in practice. And I guarantee you one thing, you can have the greatest offense in the world, and you, boy, you're running it motion or you're running a structured offense and all of a sudden boy you're getting all kinds of shots but they don't drop well they don't count anything unless they go through the hoop so shooting is something that oftentimes coaches don't spend enough time on now to answer your question you got to get a player where he we use the term groove your shot you know some of you players i guarantee you because i used to they got i call them heinz 57 because they got 57 different shots the important thing in young players is to develop where they shoot the ball the same way, where they groove their shot. So, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be a picture-perfect shot. And, and sometimes if a guy can really hit the shot, don't be messing around with him. Right? You know, I've seen a lot of unorthodox shooters and coaches say, hey, we got to get your shot, work on a little bit, and they mess it up. Well, you don't want to do that. Now, if a guy can't hit it, then you need to work with him. But you need to get out there where, where you just, we start with a player like, uh, of course, in college, it's a little different, but in high school, I used to start just from short range here, showing them, you know, the cock position here, elbow under the ball, fingertip control. This is the hand you shoot with. This is your balanced hand, you know, good balance. And then once we get follow through, good arch on the ball, we have about seven points we check. But then make sure he understands <clears throat> that he goes out there and once he grooves his shot, then it's a matter of going out and just putting hours and hours and hours in in order to become a great shooter. Shooting is an art. But if a guy's out there shooting it this time, the way one time, this way one time, this way one time, he's not going to get any better. So it's important as a young player that he understands the proper way to shoot the ball and then do it every, every time the same way. Good question. Yes. That's what I'm going to do in my next lifetime. I think they're easy to coach. Uh, I'm not sure the problem. I'm just curious on how you want to do that kind of thing. Uh, I was saying the last five or seven years, what I could do is to tell the kids, all of them that all of them practice, they want to know why they're doing that. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of questions thrown back at you. Yeah, that, a lot of times they want to say work is hard. But I would imagine that. Like when we first came to Oklahoma State, we were new coach, so to speak, just got the head. I don't know what kind of talent you've heard of, what you've already heard. How did you count the 
but I have to. Okay. See, I think it's important, and you don't have the time at high school that we do in college because we don't teach any classes. So, you know, we teach them theory of basketball, but, you know, that's like just in the fall semester. So we don't put any time in teaching classes like you have to. So what we have, we do. And this, again, is where I think you can do it to a certain degree. You must get to know your personnel, your players as best you can. You must have some individual sessions with each player. You certainly, if you don't have the time, you can do it as a group. And that's why I say every day we will have a short session before practice and talk to them. I have these guys and they're assigned uh, players and we make them come by our office every day. But on the way to class, they got to come by and see us. And so we get, get a real book on, on each one of our players. So it's a little bit easier but when I went in there, I just sat down with them. I said, guys, uh, this is what we have done other places, and this is what we're going to do here. And some of the things that I talked about here today, I would say I've been out here an hour and 20 minutes talking. Probably half of that time, things that we talked about here today, I talked to them. I talked to them about, hey, we're a family. You got a problem? It's our problem. I may not have a solution for it, but we're going to search like the Dixons to find you some help. You've got to gain their trust, and you've got to, they've got to understand that, hey, we don't just care about what's going on that basketball floor. We care about you as people. And again, it goes back. They are going to ask sometimes, hey, why are we doing this? Well, then you have to explain to them. You know, it used to be when I first started coaching, you could do almost anything, and, and nobody would ever question. That was, a, that was the way it was in, in, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it changed. And young people, I guess, got to a point where, hey, we're not going to listen. We, we want a reason. Or we want a, you to answer why sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. My son sometimes questions when I say, hey, you got to be home at 12 o'clock. Why, Dad? Everybody else going to be out. I say, I don't care about everybody else. I love you and I care about you and I want you home at 12 o'clock. I said, someday when you have a, a son or a daughter, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's the same way with the team. If they fully understand it, I'm making this decision based on what I think is best for you and the team, then they, they usually accept that. I hope all of you have a great summer, and I hope all of you are successful next year, and the people that are clo you know, live in Texas or close by, I hope you have the opportunity to watch our team play. Uh, we don't ever send films out because we've lost so many, but we certainly encourage uh, any of you, that if you're ever passing through Stillwater and you have to go a little bit out of the way to get to Stillwater. But if you're ever that way, you're certainly welcome to come in and look at our film. And if we can help you in any way, well, uh, we certainly would like to do that. You ever see any good players? And uh, I sent them either to Ole Miss or Oklahoma State. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. Okay. But uh, coaching is a wonderful profession. I coached it 33 years. I've enjoyed it so much. I hope I can coach a few more years. And dealing with young people, I think, has helped keep me young. And uh, even though it doesn't, I don't look like I'm young, but it's certainly I've got a young heart. And I think coaching young people has allowed me to, to feel that way. Uh, these guys, uh, as I said earlier, are marvelous people, great coaches. And uh, I guess they'll have another session in the morning. And what uh, they're teaching you is basically uh, what we have done all the places I have been. And thanks a lot for being so attentive. You've really been good. Thank you.